to get some movement in there. <laughs> I feel so lucky that my research as a historian also allows me to spend time thinking and writing about this movement that I call my spiritual home. Throughout the history of the United States, we've tried a variety of scientific and religious approaches to understanding the nature of our humanity. For example, what makes us moral creatures? Like other animals in so many ways, but determined to think about our actions in terms of good and evil. And what makes each individual so complex and unique, but nevertheless brings us together, draws us together to connect, to grow, and to live with integrity. This sermon is part of a larger search of mine for what is at the core of Unitarian Universalism. What distinguishes us from other religious movements and from other social movements, what makes us what we are, what, make, what is at the core of who we are as a movement. Now, several years ago, I had concluded that it is our embrace of reason in our search for meaning that makes this movement so distinctive. I noted that we engage the tool of reason when we consistently reflect on our experiences and our interpretations, testing our knowledge to see that it all fits together, that we not be those people who say one thing and do another, or believe one thing in one moment and seem to throw it all out the window at the next opportunity. How does all of our believing and being and doing fit together into a coherent whole. Being a rational religious movement, we celebrate wisdom that stands up to repeated testing. And the more it has been tested, the more trustworthy it becomes. Now, of course, being a physicist by trade, that is a way of thinking about things that comes very easily to me. But I've also been curious about forms of knowledge that do not qualify as reason, that do not qualify as science. Some of humanity's great ideas have emerged in ways other than that deliberate linear process that produces rational knowledge. In particular, I'm intrigued this morning by the additional role of intuition. That that flash of insight which seems to lie beyond the power of rational testing. German chemist Friedrich Kekulé claimed that he cracked the puzzle of the circular molecular structure of benzene when he dreamed of a snake grabbing its own tail. In a similar manner, British naturalist Alfred Wallace said that the idea of natural selection came to him in a fever dream during an attack of malaria. Most of us can probably think of our own gut experiences in which a decision felt like the right or wrong choice, a place felt safe or unsafe, a person did or did not feel trustworthy, and yet we couldn't explain in rational terms what was the basis for these impressions. As dominant as that linear, rational thinking is in our culture, clearly we experience something more because our history is replete with stories of understanding and decisions made in a flash of intuition. The popular press likes to celebrate the untapped potential of this intuition, but I confess that I find many of these ambitious claims difficult to accept. Look in the New Age section in any bookstore, the few bookstores that still exist, and you'll find no end of promises to unlock our hidden powers and transform our lives. One of these books made it onto my shelf as a gift, and I waited years before finally opening it and getting acquainted with what its author, Mona Lisa Schultz, claims about intuition. Schultz describes herself as a medical intuitive, saying, quote, I do intuitive consultations over the telephone. A person calls and tells me his or her name and age, 
and nothing more. Then, never having met or even seen the individual in question, I perform a long-distance reading. I discern the person's physical condition and the emotional state of his or her life, and I explain to them how the two are linked together. Now, again, as a scientist, my biases are hard to hide. <laughs> it's claims like that that make it difficult for me to trust much of the work that's done in the area of intuition because some of it seems improbable, even flaky. I tend to be suspicious of anything that looks to me like it might be magical thinking, and I struggle to take claims like Mona Lisa Schultz's more seriously than the newspaper's daily horoscope. But there is research, however, that I do trust as a starting point to share with you as we question the function of intuition. Caltech professor of neurobiology, John Allman, has identified the specialized brain cells that he believes play a key role in our moments of inspiration. Von Economo neurons, as he calls them, are brain cells that appeared relatively recently relatively late in our evolution, are relatively abundant only in the human brain, and allow us to make exceptionally fast decisions about complicated situations. They're shaped in an unusual way, and they're highly interconnected, more so than the typical brain cells are, and so their function allows us to weigh many variables very quickly and at the same time especially useful in situations such as social interactions, which are quite complicated and subtle, and reduce them to a quick conclusion. Everyday situations don't always allow us to do the kind of lengthy, deliberate analysis that's required in rational thinking, but these von Economo cells make it possible to reach certain kinds of judgments very quickly in what seems like a flash of insight. Perhaps even more fascinating is how ingenious are these mechanisms for intuition. Although the human nervous system extends throughout our entire body, it's clear that the brain is the headquarters where most of the processing and decision making takes place. However, in addition to the centralized nervous system of the brain and the spinal cord, we have an additional nervous system in the lining of our intestines. This second brain, as anatomist Michael Gershon calls it, is a structure with no equivalent anywhere else in our bodies, containing many of the same structures and neurotransmitters as in the brain, and actually able to function independently from the brain and spinal cord if we need it. You see, the digestive system is exposed to so much from the outside world in the food we ingest that it's critical to, that it be able to react quickly if something is dangerous. And so it seems that this gut wisdom has evolved to react to social or situational dangers as well. Not just dangerous foods, but dangerous moments, dangerous events. Almond's von Economo cells are interesting also in that they contain a certain kind of receptor for the brain chemical serotonin not generally found in other parts of the brain and located in only one other part of our bodies. You guessed it, in our guts. It seems that the metaphor of knowing something at a gut level is not that far off. Now I think that Allman's findings are more than just entertaining trivia. He has noted, for example, that the subtle but powerful role that these neurons play is inhibited in people that are diagnosed on the autism spectrum. And so the complicated dance of communication and interaction that many of us take for granted, the facial cues, the subtle shifts in voice or posture that many people with autism find confusing, may be connected to how these cells in our brain and the ones in our gut communicate. Our growing understanding of the role of intuition has reached the popular press a few years ago in the form 
of Malcolm Gladwell's popular book, Blink. Gladwell seems to be making a name for himself as an engaging popular science writer, and Blink has gotten people to look more closely at how we make everyday decisions. The conventional wisdom based on the success and reliability of reason, of rational, deliberate thinking, has been that better decisions are made when we receive more information about a situation and when we can spend more time weighing the costs and benefits of a choice. However, Gladwell wants us to look at the possibility that this extra time and extra information may not always be helpful. One experiment that I'm especially fond of citing involves subjects identifying playing cards that are shown to them very quickly, only for a brief moment. Now, unknown to them is that some of the cards don't conform to the standard pattern. That is, the experimental deck contains things like a red ace of spades or a black queen of hearts. People originally misidentify the cards as if they were a part of a standard deck, mentally changing either the color or the suit so that the two match. As they're given gradually longer glimpses of these cards, however, subjects begin to experience physical and emotional signs of distress, sweating, anxiety, confusion, and then finally, in a flash of understanding, they realize they're being tricked. Once it's clear that the rules were not what they had assumed, they can identify all the cards correctly with no problems and no anxiety. But for a moment, it appears that the physical body knows something that the rational mind does not. And here may lie the basis of our capacity for intuition. Gladwell claims that this gut knowledge is often enough for us to make the decisions we need in certain situations, and that looking for more information may simply confuse the process. For example, he cites a dramatic anecdote about a Cleveland fire department in a life or death situation. A crew of firefighters had entered the front door of a house to put out a fire in the kitchen but the water they were spraying on it wasn't making the difference that it should have. Based on a flash of feeling, the lieutenant rushed the crew of firefighters back out the door. Although he couldn't have explained exactly why in that moment, he realized that something critical was wrong. The living room they had been standing in had been too hot, and the fire hadn't responded to water the way kitchen fires should and the fire was quiet. It wasn't the roar that he expected from a typical fire. Seconds after the lieutenant pushed his crew back out the front door, the floor they had been standing on collapsed. The heart of the fire had actually been beneath them in the basement. Gladwell concludes that pausing to reflect on why the fire was behaving oddly might have meant death for those firefighters. It isn't always in our best interest to stop and think further about something that we've already grasped on a gut level. Choosing to stop before we waste precious time or take on unnecessary information is what he calls thin slicing. This is also the sort of thinking that takes place in the fashion of speed dating, in which potential couples get together for just a few moments to meet and form gut impressions of each other and the ones that click make arrangements to spend more time together later. Anecdotes like these challenge my inclination to dismiss intuitives like Mona Lisa Schultz, who claim to be able to learn so much about us from just the briefest encounter. Despite my skepticism, this is something that I'm trying to keep a more open mind about. Another example of thin slicing that I want to relate to you is a story from the Munich Philharmonic Orchestra. Because one of the applicants for the orchestra was the son of another well-known musician, candidates for the position of trombonist stood behind a drape so that the judging committee would not be prejudiced. Gladwell relates that when trombonist Abby Conant finished her audition, 
the judges were so floored by her performance that they even sent the remaining 17 candidates home. She was so clearly the right choice. But shouts of astonishment greeted her when she was brought out to meet the committee. They had been firmly convinced that a woman could not master a masculine instrument like the trombone. And so they had assumed from the quality of her playing that she must have been a man. In this case, the anonymous audition process allowed Conant's playing to win out over the biases that would surely have prevented her from being chosen. In this example, Gladwell wants us to recognize that thin slicing can work against us as well as for us. If the committee had known Conant's gender from the start, their prejudices might have biased their evaluations. And many of us have had the experience of having to work to overcome a bad first impression that someone or something has given us. Our gut level biases can be problematic as well as promising. Now you might ask why I consider this topic important enough to spend our time together on it when I know that people come here not just for intellectual stimulation but also for comfort and connection. I want to acknowledge that there's a significant tension in our religious tradition about the value of reason in our meaning making. Unitarian Universalist congregations are composed of such a variety of people, such a great diversity of philosophies and paths and inclinations and prejudices and passions. A great number of people come to celebrate and nurture the bright light of the intellect and the illuminating power of reason. But others are more interested in matters of the heart, wanting to cultivate compassion and a deeper understanding of the dimensions of life that we call sacred. Some find that rational path to be too cold and detached for their taste, and others find all of this talk of spirituality to be too silly and sentimental. I have a lot of sympathy for people caught up in this tension because I find myself as a scientist and a minister trying to bridge those two extremes as well. I'm always looking for better ways to grow as an academic and deepen in the ways of the heart. The fourth principle of Unitarian Universalism calls us to practice a free and responsible search for truth and meaning, keeping an eye on how we are searching, making sure that we're remaining true to our values. I also want to raise the point that this question has been a religious issue for centuries, often expressed in debates about the concept of grace. In traditional Christian theology, grace is the unearned, undeserved gift from God that invites us into a life of wholeness and integrity. In this context, though, we might want to think more broadly than that traditional idea and consider the concept of grace might have some value for Unitarian Universalists too. It's a persistent challenge for many of us to let go of the need to feel control over every element of our lives and so to be able to trust in knowledge that we're not in control of, knowledge that seems to rise up out of nowhere unbidden and unaffected by our attempts to analyze it I'll just speak from my own experience as an inveterate controlling personality and say that letting go of this kind of control is not easy for me. The idea of grace also calls to mind its other definition as physical poise and skill. The grace of a dancer who distills years of grueling practice into a moment of weightlessness. A musician who brings years of scales and exercises into a performance that appears effortless. Grace in the religious sense reminds us that there are dimensions in our seeking that can flow as naturally and intuitively as the gracefulness of an accomplished dancer. Our inclination to scrutinize and analyze and control our every act can become a misuse of reason 
if we fail to honor that there may be a graceful quality to our knowing as well. Now, it would be easy to conclude that I'm asking Unitarian Universalists to simply throw out rational thought and thin slice our every encounter, turning off the faculty of reason in favor of the gut. In fact, I fear that many of my colleagues dismissed Gladwell's book out of exactly that suspicion. Perhaps it was a tactical error on his part to subtitle it with the words, the power of thinking without thinking. Because in our community, it seems to me that them's fighting words. <laughs> no, I want to acknowledge that reason is actually critical to the success of Gladwell's thin slicing because we still have to use rational thought to know when and what to slice. The crew of firefighters felt in their guts that something was wrong because they came to that fire already knowledgeable and experienced firefighters. The apparently effortless performance of an artist only follows a lifetime of disciplined effort. We become able to follow the insight of intuition because we have engaged in the rational task of understanding ourselves and rejecting the biases that might lead us to ignore the inspiration of intuition. I wanted us to spend this time together exploring the subject of intuition because the free and responsible search for truth and meaning says to me that we not only use the tools that have proven themselves over the course of centuries, but that we are also open to new ways of knowing, new ways of being together. How does intuition, I'd like to ask you, how does intuition express itself in your search for truth and meaning? How do you balance your gut with your sense of reason? For all the gifts of mind and heart that make this journey such an adventure, may we be grateful. Now I'd like to invite you into a conversation. <laughs>